You hear me now? Yes. Whoa. Yeah, it's better. This is. <laughs> it's too loud now. Is that correct? No, I, I, I can yeah, turn it, down. It's fine. I can turn down my uh, my sound no, somehow. Not, it's not you turning down me, but it's me turning <laughs> myself up in a nice way. Hang on. I'm going in settings. Hang on. So it should say automatically adjust settings and then it would. Okay. I've set it to automatically adjust settings. How's that now? That's okay. Sounds good, yeah. Cool. Is is a new mic that I got since well, a couple of weeks now, but I'm um, not too too convinced actually. It's one of these podcast mics, but uh, for some reason they're not not really what I thought they would be. Hello there. Oh, that's nice. People are saying hello in the text chat. There is Hind Elias who says, this is Hind Elias, Executive Secretary at Africa TESOL from Saudi. Oh, that is wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hello, Hind. It's great to have you with us today. We are just um, going to Facebook Live. Mm-hmm, okay. I'm trying to find it on my iPad and I'm not... Uh, it's still getting in. Okay. Hello, Nicoletta is still connecting. So how Excuse many applications me. did you have, Maha? Um, almost a hundred. Less than a hundred. Less than a hundred. Then I think you should let them in. <laughs> yeah, <unfortunately. laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we'll see what we're going to do. Is the waiting room still active? Excuse me? Is the waiting room still active? Yes, whenever the, the people come in, I, I allow them in right away. I think as soon as the session has started, you can disable the waiting room, really. Because there's a password on the, on the thing. Why, why bother with the waiting room then? It just makes a lot of fun. Okay. to make sure. So, so far. We are already uh, live now on Facebook. Okay, sounds good. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> We have somebody here from GSIC. Oh, uh, Hind is a GSIC committee member and TESOL international member of PDPC and KSALLT, TESOL PD coordinator in Saudi. There was no password. That's true, actually. I mean, uh, you put in password, ESL something, and I didn't have to put in a password. You're right. Hind. Very nice to meet you, Hind. So you're connecting from Saudi, and uh, it's close to where Vance used to live. Yep, he used to live in Dahran. And do you know, well, Dahran, how far is that from where you are? I'm moving there actually, interesting. Oh nice, I was teaching at University of Petroleum and Minerals. I think, uh, oh wow, that's uh -huh. I'm in Jeddah. You're in Jeddah, did you say? Vance used to live. Yep, he used to live in Dakran. Your yeah. voice is breaking a bit in. Can you repeat that? In, do you know, well? Okay. Um, I'm in Jeddah. I've been living here for the past six years. And I moved to the mom. Yeah. Very nice. And nice Hind, to meet you all. Hind, um, how is uh, the situation in Saudi Arabia there at the moment? Um, uh, we were on um, a lockdown for a while at the beginning, but now uh, and there was a curfew, but now um, back to normal. Um, we still have a lot of cases, but you know, we're just trying with social distancing and, and but 
you know, I think lockdown was actually better. <laughs> it was a bit difficult, but it was more controlled. Right, right. Okay, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, sorry to hear. And um, Hind, are you at university? Yes, I work at the Niagara College. It's a Canadian college. Amazing. And what yeah, nationality are you? You don't sound... I'm oh. actually Sudanese, but I grew up in the UK. <laughs> All right. You sound so British. And you are actually South... Did you, what did you say? Benin. Benin. I'm Sudanese. So, sorry. Yes. From I'm Sudan. Benin. From Sudan. She's from Sudan. Apologies, I wasn't quite, uh, I didn't quite catch that. From Sudan and you, you were brought up in the UK, fantastic. I'm lucky to see you, Hind. <laughs> Hi. How are you, Hind? How are you doing? Yeah, it's great to it's be great. here. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? <laughs> it's great to have you great. with us today. Well, I bow Thank my you. head. Thank Thanks you for coming. Titles. <laughs> Thank you. And Nicoletta? Yeah. Did you hear us, Nicoletta? I don't want to take over the... Um, I was chit-chatting until everybody else <laughs> arrives, but it seems that we have arrived, so I'm passing over to Mahatra officially maybe start the session, I'm not sure, oh, you know. You forgot to say that this is Learning Together episode 485, and it's, what, the 29th of August? So uh, that's very important. Mm -hmm. The hint mm -hmm. asked whether they're allowed to put the videos on. Let's put the videos on, it's all right, uh, so long as the sound is fine. Uh, but let's let's keep it uh, like that for the time being, uh, to make sure that the sound is going to be all right. Um, and we uh, are going to start now. So good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have Haik, uh, Philips, uh, Philip and Van Stevens with us today. Uh, and uh, uh, we are uh, starting the second bouncing pool for this month, for August. Um, and then, and uh, let me introduce Vance and Hayek first before we start. Hi, Haika. <laughs> oh, would you like me to introduce myself? Sure. Uh, it's up to you. <laughs> would you like to go ahead? I can read my own bio. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Now, uh, my problem is let's talk online and I'm in Brussels and I've been increasingly been busy in virtual environments for language learning at a distance in real time and started off with virtual classroom technology and then carried on with a virtual world so you tend to see me around in form of an avatar <laughs> walking in 3D, a little 3D cartoon character walking in beautiful paradisic environments, um, in countries without borders, and uh, no, it's wonderful. And uh, I, I love uh, language teaching at a distance, so I'm totally a, a person who, who loves online and been online for many years. So, over to you, Vance. Okay, uh, I still see Heike's picture. Oh yeah, here we go. Okay, there's me in the, ah, okay, that's me. This picture was taken at the uh, TESOL convention a few years ago, uh, 2018 in Chicago, I believe, and I had just seen a copy of my an article about webheads in the in TESOL Encyclopedia of um, Language Teaching, and I'm standing there at the booth with the article, with the book open to my article, and the lady there was kind enough to take my picture. So uh, that's I've, I've got well over a hundred presentations and um, I'm uh, one of my communities of practice is Webheads, Webheads in Action is what the encyclopedia article is about and um, I'm retired in Penang right now although I was teaching for about 40 years 
and mostly the ESL, also computing, things like that. Um, and basically, I, uh, I do a few things right now. I'm the editor of the TESOL EJ, that's TESOL Electronic Journal online, a free online journal. Um, and I'm uh, a coordinator of uh, Electronic Village Online. And lately we've been doing um, a, uh, a session on Minecraft, EVO Minecraft MOOC. So that's, uh, and then I do also learning together. Uh, learning together, I just told you this was the 485th session of learning together because I concatenate learning together. Anything I do online is learning together. That's what it's all about, learning together. It's a free, unfunded um, uh, podcast series. So if you look up learningtogether.net, you'll find it. And um, I've been doing that for about 10 years. So anyway, that's it. And the interesting thing is that Vance and myself, we've never met in real life. Never have. And we feel very <laughs> close as long-standing friends. And mm -hmm. I've, I've never even hugged him ever once. <laughs> we'll but have we to fix that. that online. That's so the wonders of life. It is that you feel like you, you know the person so well already, even though it's at a distance. Mm -hmm. That's true. You know, we used to say that about virtual virtual worlds. Uh, well, not virtual worlds, but uh, communities of practice that we would get to know people online. Then when you meet them at a conference or whatever, you just walk right up to them and say, hey, how are you doing? You know, wow, it's so nice to see you. And you don't have to, you go, you pass over that get to know you stage, you know, the awkward moments of meeting someone for the first time. It's just amazing. So... A lot of sure. people, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you agree, Vance, that um, it, it's not like uh, that uh, going online means increasing your friendships or contacts forever, but it's more like that you do stay connected to a, a smaller group of people quite a long time, and you become, you, you, you tend to work together even like uh, closer over the years. Or do you yeah. feel that have too many contacts now worldwide. No, no way. Uh, I've been uh, doing EVO, Electronic Village Online, for 20 years. A lot of those people I've met. Uh, a lot of them I haven't, but uh, I take the people in my session, EV the Minecraft book session. I've met uh, a few of them, but not that many, you know, so about half a dozen. And uh, I've known a lot of them for a long time, and I've been working, as, as Heike said, I've been working with her for a long time in her virtual roundtable projects. and. Uh, so many uh, online events and um, yeah even Maha. Maha is one of these people that I've met off and on in uh, virtual environments but haven't met yet but in any event you never know we might meet one day. Egypt is not that far away. Yeah sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah sure. So let's start with the very first question mm -hmm. about what do you think of blended learning? Uh, surprisingly, um, I, I have met people who asked me what is blended learning recently. So, um, Haik, would you like to well, what do you think of blended learning? What's blended learning? Well, actually, I would like to pass the ball over to, to Vance, who is demonstrating what blend, <laughs> blended learning is all about. Um, is there a chance that we could screen share, Maha? Or? Yes, uh, sure. Because um, he's the blended learning guru in my eyes. So he's, he's well, yeah, okay. Well, to start with, blended um, blended learning is a combination. Uh, it means many things to different people. Kurt Bonk used to do a slide presentation where he had a blender on the slideshow and he used to put in the elements of blended learning and then actually blend it. It actually... Blah, blah, blah. So uh, that was a, a nice graphic. I'm still looking for the share. Let's see. Nope. Oh, this will stop the screen sharing. Okay, yes, I'll continue and oh, stop. Sorry. Yeah, uh, no problem. So I'll just share my okay. screen over here. Um, okay, so I guess we're gonna have to put up those little black blobs on the on the edge because I've got a full screen here. So um, I'm I put together. Uh, Hike and I worked together actually on this uh, Google Doc. And oh, and there's a. Uh, if you want to see the Google Doc, you can go to tinyurl.com/slash/bouncing2020blended. So, 
Um, if it's got a, a table of contents, so if you want to know what we think of blended learning, you can click on blended learning and you'll see what we think about it. So blended learning is something that I got quite close to because I've I did a, a, a English language specialist session in Thailand last January. Uh, I was asked to give lots of different talks. Uh, I'm, let's see, I didn't really pull that tab up there, but um, anyway. Can you just move that black box on the right hand side step further the away? Black. And it gives us a message that says, please move this window away from the shared application. I see that. Yeah, because I'm in full screen mode now. And I don't know, maybe maybe I could just, yeah, how's that? Is that better? That's fantastic. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. So I'm also recording this in Camtasia. So oh, that's better now. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we fortunately, we got together and we worked out these little details before. Hike was very helpful. She, she always is. She's very helpful about, I, I took a course from her one time, and uh, she's really meticulous in, in uh, working with people. I, I really recommend her courses. Uh, but anyway, blended learning. I, I gave a, a workshop. Uh, maybe I just, I'll just see if I can hit it over here. Let's see, uh, there's a new tab right there. I'll go to, it's called Workshops 2020. There we go. So this is what I did in Thailand. Uh, I did workshops on blended learning. And the, the last thing I did, well, it had two parts. One was a face-to-face uh, -face part where I did the actual workshops, and the other was an online part. So the face-to-face -face took place in January, online in March and, uh, sorry, in February and March. So to see the, the uh, if you go to, this is, this is workshops.pbworks.com. Uh, I don't know, maybe somebody, well, I, I can, well, actually, if you just go to the, to the, to this, uh, document right here you can see all this stuff so all the links are there so go to tinyurl.com slash balancing 2020 blended if you want to follow along here and I'll just talk about what this is so if you go to uh, workshops 2020.pbworks.com then you'll see uh, there is uh, all, all the workshops I gave are in the sidebar over here and uh, I, I talked about tools for blended learning things like that the interesting thing is when I, I did this in January, we were just starting, we were moving around Thailand and taking flights and noticing people were wearing masks, people were getting more and more paranoid. Um, and, and then in February when I did my online course where I was specifically asked to uh, talk about blended learning. So I did a course on blended learning, learning how to create and use a blended learning classroom. So that, that link is here. When you go to workshops2020.pbworks.com, you can link to all these things. So this course uh, took, was I, I was supposed to do a consultancy on blended learning. And so blended learning is, this wiki kind of shows you what blended learning is. I did the, uh, the workshops, which are uh, over here. Okay, so like that's the the workshops I did these as face to face so but I, what I did was I set up these uh, uh, just like I do in my classes I set up a something that the students could get to on their devices and then I could go through it with them um, I, I wasn't able to flip it because I I, I tried to flip it I, I tr asked them if uh, they could check these in advance, but it turned out that the communications were very poor and most students appeared at the workshop and they didn't really, uh, ha have, hadn't had a look at it before. But So I, all these things I tried to, I, I put things there that they could follow on their devices. And so, and we also did a lot of things that I think Heike will show you, like Minty for example, she's going to do some things in Minty later on. Uh, I used lots of surveys and things like that. There's there's tools over here somewhere. Let's see if I go to the second hour. Uh, the second hour of the workshop was all about tools. So um, so anyway, I did. I, I tried to engage them through on their devices in a blended learning environment. So we were partly face to face, partly online. But then when I went to the uh, to the online learning. Um, that's this one right here. This is all online. 
of so I tried to I had to design the course quite differently now uh, what happened during that course it took place in February and uh, it was kind of going kind of slowly when we started noticing that people were going back to classes and ha and not able really to attend classes um, you know, face to face, they were having to move quickly to online environments. How do they do this? So it turns out that a good grounding in blended learning is very helpful in a situation if you're already doing blended learning, like in your in your classes. And I've got lots of examples in this uh, in this uh, document that I put up. So um, let's see. Uh, I think that was in practical examples. I've got lots of examples of. Uh, some courses I've taught in uh, in blended learning. So let's see. I think maybe no. Yeah, anyway, anyway, uh, that's okay. I'm not going to swim around in here. But uh, I've got you. You can see some of the wikis I put on with students I've been teaching since 2011, and courses I've been running in EVO online since 2004. So all of these use the same technique basically. I I set up a, a wiki for them, and um, I work with the students in online environments as much as possible, and in class we try to, you know, we, we try to make sure make it so that they have things to click on, and they can go in and out of this. Uh, they can they can work online as well as face to face. So when you have to move online, it turns out that the people who uh, are best at doing this, uh, if I can get back up to the top here, I think I can just there's a there's a should be a, a link right here. Here we go. Back to the overview. Okay. Oh, heading over. Okay. Well, anyway, it's been fiddled with, perhaps. Um, okay. I'll just swim, s come up to the top. So, um, what I've kind of written up here is how. Um, oh, this one right here. Jeff LeBeau came to one of my online classes, and he. Uh, gave a talk about how um, he was he's working with his students online in Korea uh, he had his whole department working in blogspot blogger and when they had to move to blended learning they were already there you see so he just had to add add zoom you can hear him describe that if you want um, so basically what I what happened when I gave this Online course, I I saw that uh, that uh, this was that blended learning is critical for this. Okay, so anyway, basically uh, that took us into something I'll c I call Talon, and I wrote a little uh, blog post about that, about how I got there into Talon. It's this this link right here. And we pop down to the very bottom here, and you can see about Talon. So Talon is teaching and learning in isolation. And after the online course, I started uh, talking to people about how they were coping with their online environments, and obviously through blended learning. Uh, so we did that for f uh, 20 weeks. 20 weeks, uh, we did uh, 38 episodes in Talon. And now we've moved, I stopped Talon and now I'm in Talon Squared, teaching and learning in the new normal. That's what we're talking about now. And uh, on tomorrow, at this time, I'm going to get a bunch of teachers together to talk about how they're doing. And if you want, you can go to the bottom of this document, go to this link right here, and it will show you, um, actually this, this link right there will take you directly to that uh, that listing it shows you how to get into this conversation we're having tomorrow and uh, this is how you can join it it's in zoom as well that's learning together which is like I said I've been doing this for uh, 10 years now so that's basically um, what why I think blended learning is so important there's just maybe one more thing I'd like to add and that is oops I'm in the wrong document here that is um, I think blended is lear learning is important in the classroom for three reasons and one of them is that it gives you an ability to communicate with students 
and show them exactly what you want them to do. Give them clear links to click on. Spell out what they need to do, what they need to submit, etc. Where they can find supporting materials. And it also, in these wikis, you can archive things and you can use them in later courses. You can develop courses based on, uh, on your previous wikis if you want. And the main thing though, one, one really interesting thing is that you can also, all your materials become open educational resources. So that is a wiki generally, you can search it on Google. So I give an example that uh, a colleague sitting at a couple of desks away said, hey Vance, do you remember you had some instructions for getting students on the audio boo? Do you still have those instructions somewhere? Uh, I'm preparing for my next class. I don't really want to rifle my fellow cabinets right now. I said, look, why don't you just Google it? And she says, what, Google Audio Boo? KBAC? KB, that's where we're working at Khalifa Bin Zayed Air College. Or I said, yeah, yeah, Audio Boo, Vance. And so you could try that. You could Google it. And I Googled it, and I came up on this, uh, this place where I had talked to some uh, lady named uh, Zahra in Iran. And I told her about this, so you can actually read about it. Um, and see if I... Well, it's, it's easier to see over here. I actually wrote it out. Anyway, in that, in that uh, I, I wrote about how this colleague had asked me about this. And that's the, the big difference in open, uh, in, in working in blended learning, is you have a lot of things that are online. You can share them with colleagues. So that's it for me. I can go. No, I'll listen to what Heike has to say. Everyone's muted except for me. No, no, no. Uh, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think of the idea of blended learning? Um, uh, do you support uh, uh, or do you follow some of Vance's ideas or how do you do it on your own? Well, Vance is a, is a fervent um, presenter of open educational resources. So he loves to. Uh, share all of the resources and his know-how free openly on the web. So that's one way of doing it. And I'll say there's another way. One way of doing it, such as in wikis, blogs, um, on Facebook. Um, another way of doing it is learning management systems. And learning management systems are, do kind of represent the schooling environment, such as that uh, where teachers and students have various roles in the learning management system. And I can give you some examples. That's Google Classroom, that's uh, Schoology, that's uh, Canvas, Edmodo, um, and various learning management systems that allow a measure of control over the, over the students in such as that um, it allows the teacher to see whether the student has been in the system, how long he's been there, what kind of pages the student looked at how long he's been studying, maybe, I mean, you don't know whether they really read it or whether they just, um, and also been able to address the students with assignments, etc. So, uh, which is in many respects for those freedom fighters like uh, bands who uh, is, 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 is something contrary to learning or contrary to education, because every learner should be able given the opportunity to learn everything. Um, but it does give, in many cases, also a measure of, of um, uh, a helpful, helpful, say, as a teacher, sometimes I can have a look through my students' records and can see, oh, this person is really losing out. So uh, why don't I contact that person? Because he's not been on for a while. Um, and then I can uh, help, you know, help that person to get back into it. But this, these are two different systems, and they, each of them have their um, validity and, and so forth. What I would like to know from our audience, if I may ask this question to you, um, what does blended learning actually increase the motivation of your students? Um, and if it does or doesn't, sometimes a blended learning system actually inhibits people to study. Sometimes learning management systems work the other way. 
uh, that we don't want to. We would like, as teachers, would like to provide everything for the students ready at hand. And then the uptake is not as we were hoping to. And with um, a wiki where an open educational resource is being put out on the web, um, as a teacher, it doesn't really matter because how often that's been read or not, you wouldn't know. It, you wouldn't care. <laughs> you wouldn't care less. <laughs> You know what I mean? So, so you don't even know um, whether the, the uh, information that BANSYS has put out has ever been read. Um, so it's, which system is the right one? I don't know. Uh, it, there is no either or. It's both have there, as I said, have the validity. But what do you think, um, you participants or attendees, even those on Facebook, uh, do you think blended learning would actually increase uh, motivation of your students to learn English. I assume that they're all English learners here. Can I, can I just say that blended learning is, by some definition, I mean, I, I've read this as a definition, it's supposed to be face-to-face -face plus the online component. So if you, you would know from meeting your students face-to-face -face if they had read these materials. So it's a little bit different from a totally online environment where um, you might not know, but you might have to use other tools to do that. So I just wanted to say that, clarify. Okay, here we have Ayat. Um, nice to have you, Ayat, with us. Uh, you can uh, unmute yourself, go ahead. Hi. Hi, Vans. Hi, Heike. Hi, Maha. How are you? Hi, Good to see hi, you all. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Great to see Thank you. you. Thank you. So I have two points here to uh, for Vans and Heike, actually. So for Vance, I know that you are a, um, a fan of MOOCs, and this is one form of uh, online open source kind of courses. But the point is, um, some people cannot really um, find their way through a MOOC. So they just get lost, and there is no organized way to, to follow up their work, as Heike said, compared to the other uh, form that Heike was talking about uh, through the LMS. So how do you find the question to Vance? How, how can you support those people who just like get lost in a MOOC or just start and then uh, lose track of what they could be doing because it's, it's just an open course. There are lots of people, everything is just open and there is no guidelines or time frame. There, there will be a, a maybe recommended time frame, but not a time frame as such that they need to stick to and uh, feel a sense of progress because this is another important point for uh, people who are taking a course or learning that they feel there is a, a sense of progress. On the other hand, for Heike, I think that blended learning in that definition of uh, a, blended, a blend of Facebook face and online, because there are lots of definitions for blended learning, so I go for the face-to-face -face plus uh, online. I think that this engages the learners more because they do have the two different ways of interaction, two different ways of finding content and uh, learning. If they are somehow shy to interact with their peers in a face-to-face -face class, then uh, they would interact more in, a, in, a, in the online platform or LMS. And I have seen this a lot with many of my students. Some of them feel more comfortable being online because they are not on the spot. They are not so they feel less intimidated. While others would find that the live face-to-face -face interaction is the way, the only way that they can get the most of the, um, the learning happening. So I, I think that that's what I believe about blended learning, that it gives the students different channels of communication and different ways to learn. That is wonderful. And for me, my next question would be, where do your students post? Uh, where do they learn? Where do they actually produce language? So in a blended class, they do produce it um, in the LMS and in a Facebook -face class. So we usually say like in a face-to-face -face class, they do the speaking or, and we use the, um, the LMS more for writing, but now we're using it even for speaking. So some students who wouldn't speak um, that much in, in class, they might um, interact more using a recording uh, tool or um, maybe an online um, voice thread kind of discussion. So it depends, and I think both ways face-to-face -face and online and again it depends on the learner and how how they uh, they feel comfortable with learning and expressing themselves uh, thank you Ayat uh, go ahead please yes you can unmute yourself
Well. Mahat, can I ask you to stop screen sharing? Because on Facebook, all people see is the uh, the JPEG. So if we were doing the discussion, then I'd really appreciate if we stop sharing. Thank you so much. Very much. Um, okay, hand I will try to unmute you. Oh, I managed to unmute. Yes, um, that's great. So, yeah. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, um, I think um, uh, a blended environment is is uh, much better than uh, face learning where you're not sure if the students are going to actually um, uh, read the materials or do the work so they can do it at home and then when they come to class they get to you get to check that they've been doing the work and um, um, it's a great way to um, it, you know follow up when they come to class and um, 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 in my um, environment, in my uh, university, uh, the students had problems um, with, with online learning and uh, posting it on Edmodo or the different platforms. So we try, and some because we weren't prepared for the situation, some of the students didn't have internet access. So we would, they could do their assignments on a piece of paper and just send it on WhatsApp or you know just try to make it a lot easier for the students because we didn't have a system in place. So, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Well, I, I can assure you Germany didn't have a system in place either. <laughs> so, are we, our teachers, general, everyone, students. Uh, it, it's, it's the idea, it's the idea of getting used to things. At the beginning, it was a kind of shock for everybody because um, uh, nobody was prepared for this. Some people were already working online, but others weren't, or some others were rather shy to do that. But on the long run, we had to get used to it. And uh, at the same time, uh, it's uh, uh, trying to help students to go through it. As I had said, some of the students don't know how to go through a MOOC, but they take it step by step. If uh, it can be a lot easier if we can do it on a platform like Edmodo or Wiki or something of the sort, they can learn it step by step. How to do it, you can show it them step by step online. So you can take it from there and they can go ahead and then learn on the long run how to deal with MOOCs. So uh, uh, sometimes it, it starts difficult, but if we take it step by step, we can help people along the way. What do you think? Uh, MOOCs are very interesting, but they're not, it's, it's sort of hard, we were talking like not apples and oranges, but a fruit basket here. Uh, there are different kinds of MOOCs. One kind of MOOC, uh, like EdWeb or uh, Coursera or something like that, y they tend to be some sort of canned course where uh, students take them systematically. Uh, but there are other kinds called they call they call those by the way uh, X MOOCs because Web, WebEx or I think edX edX is one of the first uh, so George Siemens used to call them X MOOCs but the C MOOCs the connectivist MOOC it's the kind of MOOC where you rely on your peers and actually I could show you I'd I'd, ke I'd queued something up here. Um, if I can share my screen, here we go. All right, so here's uh, uh, Dave Cormier has a lovely little video here where he talks about success in a MOOC. He says there are four stages. First of all, you can orient. You, uh, when you go to the MOOC, you have to orient. He's talking about, by the way, C MOOCs, connectivist MOOCs. And then once you're in the MOOC, you figure out where you are and you start saying who you are. That's declare. And then you start meeting people uh, that you can network with. And you, because MOOCs are so massive, you're not going to meet all the people. So you can, by, the, by this time in the MOOC, hopefully you've decided, I just want to get together with a few people. And so a lot of times MOOCs, they involve lots of people, but actually 
the interactions you have with your closest collaborators in the book, or your closest uh, people with, in, with the same mindset, that's where the learning takes place. And after that, you can focus. That is, you might come up with a project. That often happens in books where you, you sort of meet this small network of people and uh, then you, uh, you just move on from the MOOC. If the MOOC ends, well, you continue. And also, George Siemens and Stephen Downs, well, Stephen Downs in particular, says that MOOCs scale. That is, um, a, a course uh, is generally tends to be teacher-centric. So the teacher is kind of in control of things. And when the teacher is in control, the students have to interact with the teacher. Uh, that doesn't happen in MOOCs. Uh, that's why they're so scattered and so hard to figure out. But because of that aspect, you can interact with other people and that's where the learning takes place. So once you've got that idea, then you're, uh, you can grasp MOOCs. You know, one thing about MOOCs, some people say complain about MOOCs because people tend not to finish them. But if you take, say, a MOOC that gets 10,000 people in it and you look at a course that might have 100 people in it, and out of that course you might have 60, 80 people finish the course, but in the MOOC with 10,000 people in it you might have 180. You know, it, I mean, that's a lot of attrition, but still, it, the MOOCs really tend to produce more people who, who finish them and who learn them. Uh, so, the one other thing is that the, uh, with, a, with a class, because it's one teacher, it, it, the MOOC doesn't scale, you, you can't really make it very large, but MOOCs play on the fact that they are uh, that they can handle a lot of people, but they don't have one person handle them. So, MOOCs a different uh, thing. You have to understand about MOOCs before you can, uh, before you can really take advantage of them. And you don't actually. A lot of times, I join a MOOC. I don't really care about the syllabus. I just want to meet the people in the MOOC. I want to learn what I can, and then I leave. You know. So, uh, I've signed up probably for ten times as many MOOCs as I've pursued for very long. And uh, the last thing about MOOCs is it's not really blended learning either. So it's a MOOC kind of has to be totally online. It's a massive open online course. So it's not really what we're talking about here. So, but anyway, it's still a very interesting topic. And, and aspects of MOOCs have to be taken into your blended learning course. So if you experience MOOCs, then you are certainly better able to design a blended learning course. Yeah. Uh, what about the experiences with teachers? I have uh, you since you have been involved in many projects with teachers. Um, uh, what about your experiences with teachers concerning blended learning and uh, uh, the idea of synchronous and, and the synchronous learning? Can I just? a little example here, <laughs> which is um, a kind of interesting. We are here talking and discussing a subject that is down to every teacher's heart, um, that every one of us has an opinion, but also has uh, maybe tried it or has tools at hand. Um, there are 11 participants in this room here. There are another 18 on Facebook. And I've been asking everyone, please share your experience. So we have, um, in a synchronous environment, in a live online environment, we have usually a large number of people who are very passive. Is that so? Do you experience that as well with your learners, that whom you don't see? They happen to be there, but they don't text that. They don't do this. Maybe they don't find the text that. I don't know. <laughs> so again, and so how do we do this? And blended learning is a means of reaching people who are tend, tend to be passive communicators in class, um, but they do like to learn. They like to be here. They like to listen. They li and lurkers, um, that is, sorry, it's, it's not a bad expression, but they, de they tend to also be quite actively learning uh, as to what's going on. And Vance has already uh, talked a lot about these uh, happy online those who are online watching on, etc., but don't get really involved. But the one question remains to all of you, and maybe if you could 
kindly ask that with a simple yes or no in the text chat. Do you feel that your learners are more motivated to learn English in a blended learning environment? Or do they think do you think they're more motivated in a simply only online environment? Or what do you think your learners, how do that learners take it? And where do your learners actively engage and post and be there and, and, and discuss and, and are part of it? What do you think, everyone? And I'm asking you, could you open the text chat and add your opinion? Because we would love to hear from you. Things may help. What do you mean, Dr. Isaya? Would you like to open your mind and uh, share your ideas? <coughs> uh, of course, Hindi, it's true that people are more engaged in face-to-face. -face. This is what they are used to. The idea is that we have got, we have, uh, we are forced to get used to the idea of online learning. So um, uh, many people, surprisingly, I met people, uh, instructors speaking about this, that some people uh, decided to stop their own courses, which they used to take face to face. They don't want to move online. They are going to wait until everything gets to normal, which is rather difficult. So uh, that's a, a stance that we are su people can suffer from. But again, how far are they going? How long are they going to wait? That's the question. So are they going to finally give up and join online learning? That's the question. It depends on environments. Well, the scale is one of the things. You see, classrooms don't really scale either because classrooms are teacher-centric. So you're, the teacher can deal with one or two students in a face to face in a class. You don't really know what the other ones are doing. In an online vir environment, you have the ability to contact all of them and put them in touch with one another through forums and things like that. So um, it's possible, depends on how you design the course. Of course, you know, some teachers are engaging normally, or some people are engaging in person, but maybe not so engaging online. Some teachers like myself or Heike, very engaging online. I've never met Heike in person. I don't really know how engaging she is. But <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, um, so <laughs> she doesn't know that about me either. <laughs> okay, so anyway, but the thing is that it's not really a, a simple question because how you, whether you're in a classroom and the, use the tools you have there or just bore the students with lecturing or whether you're on, online and l use the tools you have there you certainly have a, a much different tool set online and you can engage a lot more students uh, all this all at the same time if you if you do it properly so it's quite possible to be very engaging online I think uh, I have some lovely comments now from our participants. May I read them to you? Yes, uh, sure. Go on. Uh, one of which, I mean, in, on Facebook, Michael Birch said, it's easy to assume that the passive ones are underachievers, but it's not necessarily the case. Maybe they find the new MOOC materials too limited or prescriptive. And then um, Nicoletta said, her High school provides students and teachers with a Google studying platform such as Google Classroom and Zoom. And we have um, Rosa saying it, it's difficult since we are not a country where English is spoken, so they're not really engaged in learning English even online or face to face. Um, could, could I ask this question again to the audience? Have you found that COVID has actually changed the motivation of your learners to learn English? Um, has it increased or actually decreased? Do you think it's less or more that they uh, want to, to communicate in English, that they somewhat has changed in their attitude? It would be really interesting to find out. Thank you so much for your comments. Oh, Faisal says he thinks the staff and students are not familiar with such kind of learning. It seems difficult and all the time keep complaining of students' reply and commitments to online classes. 
staff and students need training on how to use different educational platforms, not forcing us to one type of platform. I'm, I send, I'm, in, I might send love to other platforms, Zoom, Google Meet, etc. And they're punched unwillingly, says Dr. Alham Shari. It's lovely to have you, Dr. Yus Freya Alham Shari. Very nice. I, I agree with Faisal. Um, I have my personal love does not go to Blackboard very well. Uh, I was uh, in a school where we had to use Blackboard. <coughs> I found that the bandwidth didn't really support it. The students would try to go there. They get confused in Blackboard. But if you set up a wiki for them and you say, today we're going to hit this link, click on this link in my wiki, and then it takes them on their device to Blackboard where they're already signed in, and then they, it, everything just opens right away. So, you know, it's a blended environments give you an opportunity to get around some of these, uh, to, to bring more uh, platforms into your, into your class, rather than having to, you know, if you think that, uh, if, if they tell you you have to use Blackboard or uh, Moodle or whatever, and you don't feel you have enough control over that, with a really nice, personalized, uh, your own wiki, something you have you have control over, you can assuage, you can you can massage things so that they they work well for you. Yeah, and. Uh uh, hi, how would you like to comment on these ideas? Uh, we have uh, more than one person here mentioned the idea of assessment online. Uh, and of course, it's not uh, that easy to do assessment online. What do you think of this? Um, there is technology in place to do assessment online. Um, the question is whether there's, it's able in language learning, when you have a clear, I mean, there's, for example, TOEIC tests, yeah? Um, you could do an online test with TOEIC, but what, what is difficult to determine is how well the speaking activities of the student is, uh, how well he expresses, uh, he or she ex express English in a certain context and so forth. So it's spoken and, and um, listening skills, well listening skills is better, but spoken English is still difficult to assess because there's no machine out there that would be able to assess that. So it has to be a teacher, obviously. And uh, uh, we should also not just think of assessment as in the typical exam time situation, because we could also assess how, how active has the student been throughout the year. Because if they make, a, it, it could be that they are learning English by playing video games. Who knows? You know. <laughs> um, how would you find out? So it's <laughs> it, it it is obviously a difficult uh, topic, and there's no. I mean, I couldn't say offhand a tool that says it would perfectly assess um, if I was to run the test and then I would speak into it, and then the machine would tell me you are an A2 learner with uh, dominance in speaking with a uh, b1 I, I wouldn't I, I don't know any of those yes yes but that's the point some people said that uh, uh, there are some apps that you can use online the students can and record their own answer to certain questions and then uh, it can give you a preliminary um, evaluation or assessment of this kind of learning and tells you if, if it's suitable for A1, A2, B1, B2, for example, or you, it gives you the chance to listen later on to these and you can just assess them on a, alone later on. What kind of apps are you talking about? Um, unfortunately, yeah. I have one which I, uh, someone in uh, USA said that they had this LMS. It's special for their own university. Uh, and they, uh, uh, re the students record the, the, their speaking and uh, they, they listen to it later on and this app gives them a preliminary, uh, some kind of evaluation about the level of the school. Uh, but it's something special for the university, something especially designed for them. Oh, yeah. it, would be, it would be great to have something like um, 
online. Does anybody else know? Because Krishna asked the same question. Assessment in Nepal is not good. Whether we could suggest any techniques. Anybody know? Um, I, I see here that Hinda has suggested the idea of WhatsApp. She says that WhatsApp is suitable for my uh, um, environment over here or her uh, her situation over there. Uh, so this is the idea. So I see that uh, some people are already pulling for this idea of using WhatsApp in uh, learning or in assessment uh, online because they believe it's much easier if people use iPhones or sorry, I'm sorry, mobile phones. Uh, it's much better and easier for them than getting online because they don't have even enough access to the internet or they don't have access to the internet except on their mobiles. So they prefer to use the WhatsApp sometimes in some situations. It's much better, more convenient. Very good. So, uh, would you, Maha, would you agree that uh, with Dr. Um, Yusreya? Um, sorry. Uh, Yusreya. Communication is not a problem. When it comes to gaining degrees, it is difficult. Is that so? Would you agree? You have, yeah, we have apps, but institution procedures do not match. Uh, no. Dr. Yusriya, would you, yeah, yeah, excuse me, would you mind uh, repeat the question yeah. again? Doc, Dr. Yusriya al can I, can I, Can I make a comment? Yes, please. Yes, sure, <laughs> please. Go ahead. Hello, hello, how are you? <laughs> Oh, that's a, that's, that's very good <laughs> chance to uh, to talk to you, uh, Miss Maha. You are great, and uh, thank you for this informative session. Uh, that we are, we really need to talk about it. Uh, I mean that Let learning me uh, learning knowledge uh, concerning the curriculum is not a problem now, as we can uh, use apps. You can use. Uh, a lot of presentations and so on to get uh, students know uh, their curriculum but how we guarantee that uh, the assessment process is good uh, I can see that some students uh, uh, let other students do exams for them online I can see that um, some students uh, once they click and find it it's uh, it's not uh, true they can try that, that it's false so it's not appropriate for um, deciding degrees or granting degrees in something like medicine, something like physics, like uh, uh, whatever the uh, applied science uh, is. So we can decide um, the institutional procedures also cannot help. How can I uh, impose some apps to, uh, to use with my students and the institution do not approve it for me? So I can uh, I, I can have um, uh, toolkit. I can have uh, a lot of apps for doing tests and doing assessment, but it's not illegal. It's not legal. I mean, it's not uh, imposed in the institutional procedures of, ass of assessment. Uh, you got it. You got my point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I so can you use a lot of uh, a lot of apps are available on, on the internet, and I can uh, do a lot of types of questions, MCQ, true, false, and so on. But it's not legal, and of course I cannot uh, have lists of marks or scores for students uh, from something which is not approved from them, the institution. You got my point. Uh, is there a way that is there a way that you can uh, mingle both of them? Uh, use some of the the tests or the assessment that you've already done through uh, use it in collaboration with that of the university Is uh, it possible I have to gained a course on uh, 1907 uh, about uh, instructional design and how how they put a list for cumulative assessment it's not uh, for tests it's not for uh, true false or MCQ and so on it's uh, about the uh, performance of the students throughout his uh, studying uh, modules and throughout his uh, uh, semester performing on LMS or whatever the, the platform I use. So it's not uh, a matter of uh, putting a test of 70 items and he got 69% uh, uh, of 70 out of 70. Uh, he can he can got the full work, but still the knowledge is not uh, inside his mind. How how he construct the knowledge, how how he uh, acquired the knowledge inside his mind. That's the question of the learning outcome. Yeah.
these are the difficult questions that we are having popping out nowadays again because sometimes we are having this idea of conflict between the private uh, LMSs for different universities and what is supposed to be done. Sometimes the university just want to get over with the marks and things like that and tests and uh, get over with it and they don't care about the idea of step-by-step -step assessment or what the students have already gained from what you've already because been doing. Because it's a matter of uh, by law. The by law is the 70 marks for uh, uh, tests uh, at the end or the final uh, exam and only 30 marks for the whole year uh, performance. So how can mm -hmm. I perform, for example, writing an, uh, writing an essay or writing a, a passage or writing a paragraph? That uh, it's not uh, included in true, false or um, uh, MCQ. So we have skills that cannot be assessed on the electronic system. Uh, we have mm -hmm. skills that should uh, be uh, assessed uh, through the performance of the students. He can write a paragraph including the skills of writing, including the, the punctuation, including and so on. So this is cannot be performed uh, through the uh, electronic types uh, questions like true, false and MCQ and so on or matching only. Uh, uh, yeah. for, for example, if I'm teaching translation, how can I I assess translation through uh, using MCQ or true false. Do I have to give him different uh, types of translation? So well, we don't have. Um, I'm sorry to buzz in, um, but I, I would love to ask you. You say, uh, um, as you're watching the situation now, also with COVID and the situation that is in your school, and the topic of assessment, which is always um, a present basically in the teaching context. Um, and what does everybody else think? What do you think is the future of education? Um, do you think that now because of COVID, somewhat it has changed? And if so, what do you think? Where is the trend going? And uh, in which direction is it going? And I'm asking this um, a little bit as a <laughs> final question because I would have to run, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Another ten minutes, and I still wanted to to place Menti. <laughs> ich <laughs> auch. <laughs> oh, one way or another, we are going to use online uh, learning. Yeah, in a way or another, we have to. We have to go uh, with the uh, the whole world is going in this trend, so we have to use it. But what is appropriate for each context? What is appropriate for each uh, country? Uh, uh, each type of, of students. What do you think, Yusuf? Yeah. The future. What's the future? The future. We are going to. We are going to use it. Uh, uh, in my institution, I'm going to use it this year and the last year. I'm going to use it. The team, Microsoft team. Microsoft team. And Very nice. Yeah, and uh, I also I used Google Classroom, and it was wonderful doing my tasks with the students. Oh, uh, But uh, I, I again I repeat, what we should care about is the assessment of the curriculum, the assessment of uh, a student's knowledge, not the way how do we deliver learning, because delivering learning is uh, becomes more easier with the, uh, with the different types of apps that we can use uh, and different types of uh, uh, instruction uh, tools that we can use. But we don't have the facility uh, in, the, in the same facility with assessment. We have tools for teaching, but we didn't have tools for assessment. You got it? Maybe uh, uh, maybe this takes us to the point that Fisali has already brought up here that uh, we need to give training both to staff and students, which is rather important since we have done everything all of a sudden. So we need to get to this idea of training and trying to convince the co different colleges of the different problems that are popping up here and there. Uh, Haik, what would your last word be, be concerning the future of education? Well, I'm, I'm very happy that finally the students are allowed to Google. <laughs> and this, is, this is what online learning has been in the schooling system here in Germany, whereas before children would enter school and they had to even leave their mobile phones at the entrance. And now they can be online at home and they can study as they please. They can study and they can increase their knowledge. And I believe um, that learning will increase through online learning. Uh, the speed of learning will increase, the, the pace, um, the, the volume of learning. I mean, it, it's happened to me 
through COVID, basically, I'm not quite sure about <laughs> you guys, um, that um, the pace of learning will, and also self fulfillment learning will increase. Uh, I'm hoping at least, um, because that's down to our, all our heart, that the students are self-motivated to learn English, they go on YouTube, or they play online games, or they engage in, in conversation with their peers on Facebook, etc. That's my hope. I think let's, let's hope so. Vince, what do you think? I think yes. that what Nus Rea is uh, describing is um, she's trying to assess people at the higher, the very high levels of uh, Bloom's taxonomy, in the uh, levels where they uh, they show that they've internalized what's gone before and they can actually think it through and do things with it. And the online tools that are available are tools often that address a very low level of taxonomy. So what you need to do in your program or your classes somehow is to find ways uh, that the students can synthesize. So through projects or, uh, you know, you have to find ways that, uh, that will bring the students from the low level tools that you're working with. And, and if your assessments are also low level, then not much is gonna happen with synthesis and, and uh, the higher levels of uh, extrapolation that go into the into the high into what you you're trying to test them for and i think that really is going to have to be a big redesign because uh what i i mean well so many people are referring to the new normal uh, that's the old normal actually was a problem uh, it's kind of there's a some good thing if we're not we're, we're going to hopefully abandon some of the problems that we were sort of ignoring uh, I mean, just, you know, like uh, the fact that a, good, a friend of mine told, said that on Facebook that she had just bought the, her first tank of gas since March. Okay, that's in the old normal. She was buying a lot of gas and polluting the atmosphere. Now that she's not going anywhere, she's not using so much petrol. Okay, that's in, also in, uh, in education, we also have an old normal that really wasn't, maybe it can be redesigned and made a lot better. And it's all obviously going to have to uh, take into account the fact that you can't just go back to class and unless we really get a good vaccine. Uh, things are going to change. Even, even if you can go back to class, people are going to take things from the uh, online learning. People aren't going to be all going back to offices at 8 in the morning, clogging roads and uh, spreading their diseases, even when uh, the immediate problem is over. So the same thing with classes, you know, with uh, education. We're going to have to redesign for that. Yeah. So you uh, you support um, Hike's uh, opinion of the future of education that people will go on using uh, online learning more than before? Well, yes. I think that's what I said because that's going to be the new normal. And uh, you're not going to go back to the old normal. So you're going to, the new normal is going to be something that is, gets more sophisticated. I mean, if you look at what's happening in the social media world, where uh, apps are designed, they're manipulative and addictive. Uh, maybe you could do that for education, I don't know, you know, but I mean, uh, some of these apps are really uh, kind of evil, you know, <laughs> they're, they're, but, uh, some of the things we learn from them can be applied perhaps to education and can like class dojo for example that somebody mentioned this is this is gamification that can be turned toward uh, an objective of making people want to learn what Heike brought up earlier engaging students you know uh, so this this all is going to happen with design design is going to improve I think it will possibly uh, will get rid of some of the traps we were stuck in, the ruts we were stuck in in the old normal, and we're going to hopefully come into a better world. Let's hope so. I'm an optimist. Yeah. Um, oh, let's hope so as well. Um, it seems that we are having Hannah Hamis as well on uh, Facebook, uh, and it seems that she does have a question. Can you post a question here, please? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the link. Uh, yeah, that's the one, the, the beta one of the Cambridge, yes. Um, yeah, so it seems that Anna has a question for you. I hope that they can post it over here quite quickly. Yeah, yeah, that's I think she has already posted in the 
a chat box, the speakandimprove.com, that's the Cambridge app uh, for correcting uh, writing, uh, and the, it's suitable for beginners up to advanced, and also for people who are training to get the eyelets, uh, but for the eyelets you have to pay extra money for it, but it's very interesting one. Uh, you can write, uh, put to writing, and they are going to give you a highlight the sentences for you. If they highlight it with green, that's correct. If it's uh, yellow, uh, it's uh, half and half, and if it's red, it's completely wrong. So you have to redo again and then post it once more. Um, yes, write and improve. Yes, and the speak one, that's a good one as well. Uh, uh, thank you very much for being with us here, Vance and hi. It's been great having this very uh, active or and interactive uh, discussion about blended learning. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for everybody for being with us here. And uh, please look forward uh, to uh, Hyde's um, workshop by, by the middle of September. We'll be posting the date and the link. Uh, she's going to be giving a, a special thank you very much for her. She's going to be a, giving a special workshop on Sofla which is a very interactive way for teaching online. Uh, Hayek and Vance uh, have already posted a link uh, for a Mentimeter. You can find it over here, menti.com. Um, Please go to a, this link. Question. and Yeah, that's a question for me. Please, if you could um, uh, go to menti.com at the end of this discussion, because I thought it was a wonderful discussion. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. I thought it was so fantastic that you all joined this discussion. And sure, sure. that you mentioned um, also the, the, the fact that assessment, I think we would have never even talked about this one else. And very, very good. Your input, much appreciated. Thank you so much. And please um, answer menti.com. Can I give you the number again for those in Facebook? Yes, I put, I put it once more in the awesome. comment. Awesome. Thank chat box. you very much for answering this. Okay. Yeah. I've also... Uh, I've uh, I put it at uh, yes. tinyurl.com slash bouncing2020 blended as well, so you can awesome. find it there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we work together. Okay. <laughs> yes, sure. Yeah. So, um, yes, uh, thank you very much for being with us here, Vince and Ike. It is, it's always, always a pleasure to do work with you, and we are looking forward to more collaboration. Thank you, everyone, and it's great to have uh, to have had you to, with us today. And looking forward to seeing you once more. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate appreciate your thank organizing you. this. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. It's a pleasure. Bless your work, okay. Maha. <laughs> uh, thank you, Hayek. Thank you very much, and thank you for the upcoming workshop. And um, it's always a pleasure to do work with both of you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. We'll have to talk about yes. the, the, yeah. um, the date again because I plan some holidays. <laughs> uh, you forgot. You forgot about the date. <laughs> no, I'm. I'm saying we might have to move it again. Hmm. To move the yeah. Oh, okay. It's all right. Okay. It's all right. I, I, I hope it's in September. Hope it's in September. Try and do that. Okay. Bye for now. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thank you Thank very Thank you much. very See much. You. I'm going to stop the Camtasia Thank recording. You. Bye, bye, everybody. <laughs>